Okay, so today I'm going to string an E-Force Sector 5 175 quad. Um, before I mount this on my machine, one little tip I wanted to point out when taking out the uh, main strings in the tubes is don't just, don't just yank them out from the top here because you could, you can pull through and pull through the handle, but what I have found is that it makes the tube susceptible to pull out because these tubes are not mounted through the handle very tightly and if you pull this too tight then these tubes come loose and they move, they pull up into the handle and make a big mess when you try to string in the future. So what I do is I grab a few and I actually push them further down the tube and what you'll find is that they'll all poke out the bottom of the handle like this and you can grab them and, and pull them out backwards and that way if anything you're pulling the tube further into the handle rather than further out of the handle. So that's one tip because I've actually messed up one of my own rackets before pulling these the wrong way. Uh, and now I'm going to go ahead and mount this onto the machine and the colored numbers should be right side up. And now the numbers are right side up, which means they're on the bottom half of the frame. You guys can't see them from the top, but the numbers are actually on the bottom, but I can read them right side up. And I'm gonna go ahead and mount like that. Now, one of the nice things about stringing E-Force rackets, pretty much any E-Force racket within the last 10 years is they use the same stringing pattern with one small exception, which I'll point out toward the very end. But all of the rackets with tubes here, um, the, the high-end rackets, I don't know about the budget rackets with tubes like the Chaos and stuff like that, but the last 10 years all, all use the exact same string pattern. So that includes the command, I believe the command and the command power flex, the Heat Seeker, Heat Seeker 2, the Invasion, Invasion X, the Apocalypse and Apocalypse Beta, the Takeover, Dark Star, and now the Sector 5. I think, I don't know if there's a newer racket than the Sector 5. I haven't looked or played recently. Um, but all of those rackets have the same stringing pattern. So what you'll need is uh, 40, about at least 40 feet of string, 39 is dangerous. I usually do about 41. And then I measure out eight feet, six inches of string for my um, short side. So I can do that on the edge of my table, which is approximately three feet. So I go here and then I feed eight feet, six inches down through the starting hole, which is orange hole two on the right, which is two head right. And then you feed it down the second um, tube in the middle bank, which is orange, although it looks a little yellow on this racket. Now another thing I've learned about these newer E-Forces is that the tubes in the throat are pretty tight. So actually what I have on hand now is synthetic grease. And when these tubes get so tight that I can't push the string through it anymore, I'll, uh, I'll dip the tip um, of the end in synthetic grease in order to push it through the tube more easily. Uh, I find it's a big problem when people sweat a lot or get their strings dirty because then you pull particles through the tube and it, and it doesn't, uh, it, it, bunt, it blocks the tube from putting fresh strings in. Um, also the paint on fresh strings tends to block these tubes and make it even harder to push through. So down through the tube, out through the same tube on the left, second from the top in the mid bank, the orange tube, and then out through uh, three head left, which is uh, an orange number three. All right, so I like using the starting clamp. That's what this is called. Um, and I talked about this in a previous video. We use the starting clamp here so that we never have to um, pull tension in the middle of the frame through a starting clamp. And I'll show you what I mean in just a second. So I'm gonna start here and I'm stringing this at 33 pounds plus a 10% pre-stretch. So it's gonna pull to around 36 pounds. And then after that, it's not gonna let it go below 33. So as I let it sit here, it will continue to pull out any slack. 
And a lot of the time with these E-Force rackets, because there's so much friction in the tubes, I'll give a little tug just to pull out some of the excess slack since I'm pulling two mains at the same time. So now I clamp, and now I can actually pull against the starting clamp and get both of the mains started. So pull here. Okay, clamp here. And now this is my short side. And my short side is going to come over, you're gonna skip two holes and come back from three head left to one head right and go down the red tube, which is the top tube in the middle bank. And I can already tell these tubes are gonna be a little tight, so I might need to use that grease today. Because I'm using 17 gauge string and it's still hard to push through right now. And the tubes aren't even all filled up yet. Um, and then four head left, which is uh, labeled red four. Um, yeah. Uh, there was something else I was just going to mention about feeding um, the strings through. Oh, don't use 16 gauge string on modern E-Force rackets with these long tubes. It is such a nightmare to push that string through and believe me, um, I've done it. It is a huge pain in the butt. 17 gauge string is what E-Force recommends and I wouldn't string with anything uh, thicker because the tubes are too the tubes are too thin and then I'm gonna do a Parnell knot I only use two type of knots when I'm tying off I always use Parnells unless I don't have room um, if there's not enough room on the string and you have to look up Parnell knot it's gonna be too hard to describe but I use the Parnell knot and then I believe the other one's called the Wilson knot where you don't wrap around the string twice so it takes up less room in tight spaces um, but whenever possible, I use a Parnell because it self tightens and stays tied a lot better than just a normal double, uh, double overhand or whatever it's called, just the standard knot. So we do that. I'm gonna actually allow the knot to sit back a little bit in the head, and then my short side is done. So now the short side is done and tied off at uh, three head left, which is the orange three. And now I gotta find the end on my long side and feed from two head right to, uh, two head right to three head left. Now, yellow, orange, start. Uh, yeah, yellow. So it's actually, I'm actually stringing yeah, that's right. Um, from the orange tube now to the yellow tube for my long side. So third tube down. Again, two head right to two head left, skipping two two holes in between. Feeding down the yellow tube, yellow tube, third one down in the middle bank. And up through the yellow tube on the right hand side. So it'll get a little bit easier as some of this extra slack gets taken out. So far these are sliding okay. The outer bank is usually where it really gets sticky. Okay, and then up to what, four head right? Uh, three head right, which is yellow. Okay. Notice I always keep the end of the string in my hand while I'm pulling, and it makes it just easier to manage. When I first started this was hard to get used to, but uh, maintaining control of the end of the string while you're pulling through really saves you a lot of time in the long run and tangles. Okay, so I'm going to tension here and I'm going to do the, continue to do the stretch on the mains. I like it. It's not exactly precise, but it does take out um, a little bit of the excess slack that you get from, from that double pull, like I mentioned earlier. Okay. Uh, okay, so now we're going to green, which is one head. So we're going from three head right to one head left. 
again for these for these first um, eight mains or so there's always going to be two holes in between um, where your where you're going. So this is green tube, middle bank. And again, holding the end of the string kind of with my pinky and ring finger as I pull. And this is going a little slower just because there is friction uh, in the tube. You can definitely feel it uh, slowing down. But so far, so good. It's a pretty new racket, so hopefully I don't run into too much trouble. Um, and then out five head or four head right, which is green as well. Um, for those of you who have asked, the machine that I'm using is the Gamma X Stringer or the XST. And this is a Wise 2086 tension head. So this is not the standard tensioner that would come with this machine. It usually is a crank machine where you have to hand crank, which is a lockout, and this is a constant pull um, electronic stringer. The other thing that people have asked me previously is, why do I do a pre-stretch on here? And you can see this little light right here indicates that pre-stretch. And again, it's for tension maintenance. It's because I want to pull out some of the excess um, slack out of the string so that it holds tension a little bit longer. I tend to like a little bit tighter tension on most, most rackets that I string. So now I'm going to the blue tube, which is actually six head right, down to the middle bank on the right side. Sorry, the middle tube on the right bank, the outer bank, I'm pulling down. So now I'm not doing the two gap, the two hole gap between anymore for these last several mains. Um, so that's why I do the pre-stretch, and that's why I tend to push down on the mains when I'm stringing because I want to get all that excess floppiness um, sort of relaxed out as I'm stringing. Uh, six head left blue. Sacrifice, I'm sacrificing a tiny bit of precision, most likely, in order to push on the mains when I pull. Um, but I'm okay with that because I think it gives you better consistency across both mains rather than pulling one main to the proper tension and then um, losing a little bit on the other main that got pulled along with it. So you're like dividing, you know, a lower poundage across two strings where pushing this um, gives you a little bit higher poundage to distribute across both strings, which I think, which I think gives you a better string bed. Okay, uh, purple seven left down the top tube, which is purple. And so far the tubes are sliding. This one feels pretty stuck. And this is where, see if I get lucky here. I'm not even going to try. I get about halfway down the tube and it gets stuck. So now this is where I take my synthetic grease. This is a little trick. And I, oops. And I just dip the tip in a little bit. And get off the excess. And this will just help push the string through that tube. Now is this the proper way to do it? I do not know. But I do know it's nearly impossible without. And this has saved me a lot of headache since I've gotten this. Um, and now I'm going to grab a Kleenex and wipe off the excess. So just make sure it doesn't make a mess here. Oops. Here and here. Okay. All right. So you saw it got jammed halfway. I dipped it in that synthetic grease and it went right through. And now that tube will be slightly more lubricated. Um, in general as well. That, that lube tends to stay fairly slippery over time. And then let's see if I can come up through the right side purple. This might be a little slick too. Oh, it's not bad. Or a little tight. It's not bad. And then up purple, which is uh, right five purple. Hard to see in here with this lighting. 
Okay. Oh, it's because this is the first hole where I have a string blocking it on the outside. And an awkward angle. There we go. Oh. Okay. There we go. All right. Almost done with the mains here. One more, one more after this. Well, one more pair. Okay. Same thing again. And now it's the clear set, the clear tube, which is seven head right, which is like white in color, and that's the bottom tube on the outer bank. On all these E-Force rackets, you always start on the second to top tube, first on the middle bank, and then the second to top tube on the outer bank. You never start on the top tube as you're stringing. So if you started on red or if you started on purple and worked your way down, you're doing something wrong. And again, this is true for all the high-end E-Forces. Some of the lower-end uh, E-Forces with tubes, like... Some of the bedlams I think have tubes now, and like the chaos I think has tubes. Uh, this might not apply on those rackets, but all of their flagship rackets over the past 10 years, maybe more, um, this is true. Okay, so this will complete the mains. And now one trick I do here is I string out through uh, head left five is I put my clamp down lower so I have room to do a couple crosses. I'll show you what I mean. Put my clamp like here, not quite as close to the head. Now I will lose a little tension right here, but because I'm gonna be pulling crosses against here, uh, it won't matter. So I immediately go back over to start the crosses at uh, six head left, which is the blue hole. And I usually start under the first main. Actually, I don't need this clamp here now. Okay. And six, uh, head right, blue. And I want to make sure I keep the strings consistent and not crossed on the outer portion of the racket. So this is a little tricky because I want them to line up nicely out here. And this, this is just me being a little bit picky because it looks nice and it's less likely to, um, it's less likely to break strings against the wall when you take this, uh, when you put a little bit more attention in because the strings will sit more flush on the grommets and be less likely to wear through when you hit shots off of a wall. You wanna keep, you wanna keep the strings as recessed into the, into the channel on top as you can. I just gotta get this angle just right. I'm gonna use my needle nose pliers and get this angled properly so I can get out the hole at the right angle, which is trickier than it sounds sometimes. It keeps wanting to go under. So I'm gonna switch over to another tool just in the interest of time. I'm gonna use my um, Pathfinder awl, which is here, which allows me to uh, poke something through and then put the string in and then pull it back. It's a handy tool once in a while, like right now. So now I have the all pushed through. I should be able to feed this string into it if I can. Oh, there we go. Now I can push the string into it like this and then pull it back through. Perfect. So now I've got all the strings in parallel aligned how I want on the outside of the frame. Now, another question I've seen before is why do I push the cross string down with my finger as I'm pulling through? And the reason is so that you don't notch the main strings by essentially like burning a, a, a hole or a notch into the, into the mains as you pull it across. You move, you move it sort of back and forth across the mains so that it's nice and uh, notch free. And it's a little weird to get used to that as well when you first start out, but it becomes second nature over time. So I like to string about three crosses, which again is why I left room on this clamp when I clamped. 
you'll notice I have plenty of room for these crosses. And I will pull tension on this one in just a second, but before I do that, I'm actually going to string my third cross because it makes it easier in terms of space. Um, so, I will weave this. And like that. And then I will pull, double pull the first two crosses. And I'm no longer going to push on anything because there's no, the double pulling has a lot less friction now than it did on the mains through the tube and the handle. And uh, I'm also pulling a, a shorter length of string, so no problem. Now I always want to string my crosses one ahead, otherwise the next one is, is hard, to, uh, hard to weave. And this is where it gets a little boring for a little while because... I just have to alternate crosses and the tubes work just like any other grommet. Um, you just can't clamp quite as close to the frame because you can't clamp on top of a tube. You have to clamp just before the tube, which you'll see in a second. Like this. Okay. And some people like to do this thing when you go over the two sections of grommets, there's a little gap and some people like to string a certain way so that it effectively ties down the, the grommets to each other. I've never had a problem with that personally, uh, to each their own. I, I just feel like it's an extra step that's never caused problems. But sometimes people have problems with one of their grommet sections sticking up on the outside of the frame and they like to do a slightly uh, modified method of stringing and you can look that up, but it helps just tie tie the two pieces of grommet down so they don't peel up as easily. Uh, but I just go zigzag right over the top of it. Okay. Again, this should be five to ten more minutes of pulling crosses, uh, which isn't particularly interesting, but I do want to show you as I get toward the end, the one thing that has changed in terms of the E4 stringing pattern within the last oh, seven or eight years, probably in like 2013 or so, probably with like the uh, Invasion or the Invasion X, which is like what, 2013 maybe, 2014, something like that. when when this changed, basically when the tubes became bigger and longer, which was I think after the Heat Seeker 2.0, so it would be the Invasion, I think, um, is when there was a slight change made to the pattern at the very end in order to enable you to tie off properly. So we'll get there in just a minute and I'll show you. I'll show you what the difference is. But I'm just zigzagging here and you see how I feed the string using both of my pointer fingers and it, it, it goes through pretty quickly. Um, one other method I'm using that you, I don't know if you guys noticed was I twist the string around the bolo or diabolo or whatever it's called twice um, and I think it just helps reduce the amount of pressure on the string that's um, being used to pull tension here. It just gives a little bit less, a uh, little bit less tension or stress, I guess. Because um, if I tie it once, then this one loop takes all of the um, pressure when I pull. But when I put two loops here, it's distributed a little bit more across the length of string. And again, notice that. I can go ahead and clamp as soon as the beep happens. I don't need to, to wait for it or do any um, presses like I did with the main strings because these, these uh, crosses are so much shorter and less um, friction. 
And I'm really happy I only needed to use the grease on, on one of the tubes. A lot of these modern E-Force rackets for the past couple of years especially, I feel like they've reduced the diameter of the tubes and the handle. Um, probably to eliminate some of the vibration feel is my guess. Um, but it's making them harder to string. Uh, and by the way, if you're curious, the string I'm using is for this particular racket is uh, Oxygen 17 in black, which is the same string that comes on these rackets, although um, I think they use natural color, but nobody likes natural color, so I, I restock the black. Um, black is pretty much what I'd stock on all strings now because everybody likes it. And Nope, nobody would prefer natural. Well, I have one person who prefers natural because he thinks it plays differently than the black, but um, I don't think anybody argues that natural really looks better. Okay, so we have five more mains, or uh, crosses rather, and then we're done. And I'll show you the final tie off. Again, you'll notice where I'm clamping here is just is kind of as close as I can get to the to the tube, but it's another two inches to the actual frame. Um, but that's okay because you're pulling tension when you go the other direction. Um, while I'm coming close to finishing this, one more point that I'd address is the difference between a lockout machine or a crank machine and a constant pull or an electronic, which is electronic will keep pulling tension every so often, every couple seconds or a second or whatever after the beep to continue to maintain whatever tension I've dialed in. Whereas what a lockout machine does is as you pull the lever, it stops pulling once a certain tension is hit. And at that point, it's no longer pulling anymore unless you undo it and re-pull the lever. And what that means is, as soon as that lockout tension is hit, the strings start losing tension immediately. I mean, they're not gonna go floppy or anything, but they lose a couple pounds of pressure right away. And with a constant pull machine, so long as you're leaving it on the machine, um, it's going to continue to pull that tension out of the string and so you're going to typically get a tighter string job. So when you're talking to your customers or when you're requesting somebody to restring your own racket, it's nice to know whether somebody's using a constant pull machine like this or a lockout because a, a lockout is going to feel looser at the same um, tension setting as a constant pull. I, I would estimate probably five to 10% looser. So I would ask for, you know, two, two or three pounds tighter um, on, a, um, on a lockout machine. And I just actually um, missed a step here. And this is where the last step comes in, the one where I was talking about the Invasion X being a little bit different. Um, and that's because they added one more tube at the bottom after the, I think it was after the Heatseeker 2.0. They used to have short tubes and they used to have one fewer tubes. Um, they added another tube, which means you can't tie off here, which is where you used to tie off. So on the bottom, um, on the bottom crosses, you actually have to skip the second to last cross, which is the, which is the last tube, go all the way to the bottom because this is going to allow you to tie off properly at the bottom. And you'll see what I mean in just a second. So you skip and you have to make sure that you string the same over under pattern as the, as the one that you did on the second to last tube. So these are the same over under pattern right now. 
And I just realized I lost the last few minutes, but um, I'm using a Parnell knot again, tying off on the very bottom main. Remember, as I was doing crosses, I skipped the bottom tube and then came back to it as my last cross so that I can tie off at the bottom using a Parnell knot um, again. And I use a Parnell knot whenever I can, even when I'm doing a starting knot, uh, I tend to use that. I never, I never do a different knot for a starting knot. And I do lose a few pounds of tension as this knot recesses back into the frame. But now we're good and occasionally I'll do a quick check to make sure the crosses are, you know, nice and square and, and straight across. And that's actually looking pretty good. And uh, we're all set. So hopefully that was helpful. And if you have any questions on E-Force rackets especially, leave them in the comments below and I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks.